So. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone uh, in today's webinar. Uh, this is the first webinar from the IEEE Electron Device Society student branch chapter at University of Dhaka. Uh, I am Dr. Maimou Hussain, Assistant Professor, Department of Tripoli at University of Dhaka. So <clears throat> we have uh, uh, two distinguished speakers today. So I will introduce them uh, very shortly. Uh, but before I do that, uh, uh, let me uh, talk a little bit about EDS. Uh, what it means and why you should be a member of EDS. Okay, so EDS stands for Electron Devices Society. Okay, so uh, now what is the field of interest or what is the scope of EDS? Okay, uh, basically it covers uh, the area related to uh, semiconductor devices, organic materials, and nowadays uh, you talk about quantum. Um, computing or quantum devices. So everything that has to deal with these devices or the device physics uh, uh, related to these uh, materials uh, falls under EDS. It could be experiments, it could be simulation, it could be theory, modeling, anything related to these devices is EDS. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> what is the mission of EDS? So these slides I have taken from the EDS website. So they have a very big presentation. So I've just uh, taken some portion of that. So what is the mission of EDS? Okay. So basically it's a platform. You can uh, exchange, you can uh, uh, share your ideas, technical informations, publications, and you can educate yourselves uh, about these types of devices. Okay. And uh, now, the, that was the mission of EDS as a society. Now, what is the vision? Okay, so EDS says their vision is promoting excellence in the field of electron devices for the benefit of humanity. Devices are everywhere. Huh? So right now we are using the Zoom platform in a computer. We are using webcam. We are using speakers. So everything is like devices around you. So anything you use for the benefit of you or your society has something to do with electronic devices. Okay? So EDS uh, allows you to grow professionally as a researcher, as a careerist in this field. And uh, it provides you with uh, lots of educational materials, journals, there are lots of conferences and all. And also it recognizes your contribution in the field. So what you can do basically that is recognized by EDS, okay? Now, uh, <clears throat> EDS has very uh, prominent journals in the field, okay? These are the, uh, here's a list of the journals by EDS. Uh, I won't go over the list, but uh, you can see there are some uh, very uh, popular names like transactions on electron devices. Then uh, Journal of Light Wave Technology, which deals with optoelectronic devices, and then transactions on semiconductor manufacturing and all. So these are very, very well recognized, well reputed journals. Okay, EDS has uh, a lot of flagship conferences. Okay, which are uh, like really popular in the field, and some of the best conferences you can see there on the list, and uh, the most a popular one, or I would say the best one for devices is IEDM. It stands for International Electron Device Meeting. So publishing over here is extremely difficult. And this conference is, uh, I mean, the best conference in the field of <coughs> electron devices. And there are some other good conferences as well. Okay. Now, <coughs> uh, so, what services can you get after becoming an EDS member? As I said, you can get a lot of educational materials. You can access the journals. You can do some networking, connect with other people who are working in this field. You can nominate somebody for awards. Okay, somebody can nominate you for awards. Okay, uh, you can actually uh, the, uh, get good leadership experience because you'll be running this uh, society. Uh, from the student uh, side. 
So you get some leadership uh, experience from there. You can uh, submit some projects for funding. You can definitely the experience matters. You can learn from uh, distinguished speakers and all, and you can make good friends. Okay, so lots of lots of benefits. Now, EDS has very uh, has, has a huge database which is accessible only to their members. And uh, that database has lots of good talks by distinguished scholars. You can see like, uh, like uh, big uh, legends like Professor Mark Lundstrom from Purdue, Professor Cheng Minghu from Berkeley. So you can listen to their uh, lectures, learn what is the recent update in the field, what is the latest technology. So you can access all these materials from the EDS website. And then you can actually uh, listen to uh, different uh, podcasts, which are like audio uh, talks, not video. So you can learn from there as well. And then you have the magazines and all these things. Now, EDS recognizes contribution in the field. You can see lots of, uh, of uh, very uh, distinguished uh, fellows here. Uh, and like, for example, Professor Leo Isaki is known for Isaki diodes, and he got the Nobel Prize for that. Professor Martin Green is one of the pioneers in solar cell technology, and I know some of you have read his books. It's a textbook in every Tripoli uh, department for solar cells. So lots of awards. Now, EDS also gives you uh, funds funds for uh, small projects if you want to uh, if you are interested to do something hands-on you can apply for example you can see some recently uh, supported projects like photovoltaic solar uh, cells or solar alliance and then this is an interesting project on solar power desalinization okay so uh, these are eds funded and uh, research projects okay how do you become a member of the EDS. There's an EDS event going on. You can, uh, if you are an IEEE member, you get free EDS membership. You just need to visit their site or you can contact the EDS in student branch and they can help you. Okay, the deadline is uh, 31st December 2021. Now, coming to that, uh, uh, this is a very interesting part that EDS has. They have a distinguished lecturer program. So you know that IEEE divided, is divided into several regions and we are part of region 10, which is Asia and the uh, surrounding uh, areas, okay? And for the EDS distinguished lectures from each region, they identified a group of speakers who are very distinguished in their fields, okay? And they're very good speakers as well, okay? From Bangladesh, we have uh, one distinguished lecturer, EDS lecturer, and that is Professor Anisul Haq, uh, who is a professor from East West University, former professor of Buet. So he uh, is supposed to be here today as one of our speakers. So let's see if he can make it. So he has some family emergency all of a sudden. So we'll see. Uh, and then uh, there's an interesting uh, event by the EDS that is called the Mini Colloquia. So what is the mini colloquia is uh, where you have a group of these distinguished uh, professors coming together. Uh, it's like a mini uh, conference, you can say, where uh, these distinguished speakers, they give a talk. Earlier this year, the EDS uh, uh, student chapter from Buet, uh, they organized a mini colloquia where we had three distinguished EDS lecturers giving keynote talks, okay? So hopefully uh, the, our newly formed EDS branch, we also plan to do some mini colloquia in future as well uh, from Dhaka University. So you should join EDS, okay? Enough branding. You can find more details in their social media websites and all. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, the EDS chapter in Dhaka University. Uh, we got the official approval from IEEE on May 26th this year, so not too long ago. And this is the second EDS student run chapter in Bangladesh after Buet. Okay, so uh, you can find more details 
of us in this uh, links. We have our official website now and our executive committee members, they did an excellent job and they came up with a very nice website. You can go and check that out. We have a Facebook page and we have a YouTube channel where we are going to upload the recordings for our talks. Okay. So uh, we have a goal in mind. We say that we are uh, trying to promote excellence in research and learning in the area of electron devices. Okay. So these are the executive team members. We have uh, Zarif as the vice chair, is also from third year AAA. DU, Intias from the Robotics and Mechatronics Engineering Department, second year student, and Fritogo is also from Triple D DU, second year. And then we have Niloy from second year, Shadmin from second year, Yasin Arafat also from second year, all from Triple DU. And then we have Mohian Rahman, uh, the general member from Triple DU. So all the nice banners and websites that you see <coughs> are actually credit goes to Shadmin and yes, in for their nice work. And obviously everybody is supporting them. Uh, okay, so uh, that brings us to our, our event today. So we have uh, split it up into two parts. Uh, one we call the journey of the transistor where Professor Anisul Hop, who is a distinguished lecturer from EDS, IEEE, uh, we'll talk about the evaluation of this transistor technology. And then we have uh, our alumni from the Tripoli Department of Dhaka University, Yasin Choudhury, who is <coughs> currently working in ASML in Netherlands. And he's going to talk about extreme UV lithography, which is the latest and the greatest in device fabrication technology, okay? So, uh, so the cell phones that you are using right now, probably like 14 nanometer or so. Next is gonna be like seven nanometer chips. And for that, you need extreme UV lithography. So we'll uh, talk about that in a bit. And then, uh, so just uh, for the audience, I just have uh, a small update is that uh, Professor Rani Sulhak has sent his apologies. Uh, he had some family emergency today, earlier today. So he might be late, uh, so he'll let us know. And uh, so we'll start with uh, uh, our speaker, Yasin Choudhury, on the UV lithography. So let me uh, just uh, go over his brief, uh, uh, CV. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Yasin Choudhury is currently a functional architect at UV Source Metrology at ASML in Netherlands, and his work focuses on uh, the state-of-the-art optical metrology module used in the EUV. So, of and photolithography a lot of experience in the industry. And before joining uh, UV source, he worked on deep UV and extreme UV scanners in many projects as an optical design engineer, and mainly dealing with uh, different metrology techniques, interferometry, and image sensing. Okay. And before joining SML, he has indeed his master's in photonics in Belgium at the University of Ghent and in Sweden, KTH. And uh, before coming to Europe, he was a system engineer in Grammy Phone and he completed his bachelor's and master's degree from the Department of Applied Physics, Electronics and Communication Engineering, which is now known as Tripoli at the University of Dhaka. So <clears throat> with uh, no further delays, I'll stop sharing my screen and I uh, hand it over to Yasin Choudhury for his exciting presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot, Mainul. Uh, can you guys see my screen?
Yes, yes, we can uh, see your screen. Yes. I think I'm showing the wrong uh, monitor. No, no, we can see your screen. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. All right. Okay, my name is Yasin. Uh, good afternoon and in Netherlands and good evening for uh, people joining from Bangladesh. The topic for today is UV lithography. So how, how we're going to use it to push the Moore's law forward. Uh, here's the short agenda for my talk. I'll be starting in English, but I don't know if uh, some non-Bengali speaker are joining or not. Uh, I will try to speak as slow as possible. If something is not clear, please interrupt. You can uh, ask question in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and ask directly. Uh, maybe sometimes I switch to Bengali a bit if something is not uh, very clear, but uh, primarily I'll be speaking uh, in English. Uh, I'll, I'll be starting with the market trend. Huh? So, so uh, everything begins with the necessity, so that the need for uh, uh, a good uh, lithography tool. So what kind of application we need for that? So the next one would be uh, starting, of course, with the Moore's law, which is driving the industry for more than <laughs> five decades. So I will explain a bit why smaller is better and what kind of limitations we have with, uh, with that. And of course, how lithography works, and what is the working principle behind it, and how we can uh, move it forward by using extreme ultraviolet technology, what kind of challenges we have, and also looking ahead for even uh, better technology than uh, no, regular UV nowadays. It's, it's a high NA, high, high numerical aperture uh, UV lithography. Then I'm going to finish with key takeaways. All right. Uh, chips are everywhere, right? So uh, the platform we're using, as Mindel mentioned, the Zoom, uh, using your uh, laptop and connectivity using the internet, all, all needs uh, microchips. It's, it's, it's really hard to imagine a world without chips. Huh? So uh, uh, like uh, if without chips, there will be no computers for a start, uh, no mobile phones, uh, no gaming, and also no data center. But microchips, it can be found in, in less obvious places. For example, uh, a, a car. Uh, a car is actually a, a chip on, on uh, so it's, it's like a computer on, on, on wheels, huh? because uh, in, in a car you can find uh, microchips basically everywhere from sensing uh, uh, like uh, adaptive cruise control or uh, sensing uh, the range. So you have to uh, turn on the wind, wind uh, uh, turn on the wipers. It can also be to regulate the engines, but you can also find microchips in, in, in things like a refrigerator, for example, so like microcontrollers or for uh, medical imaging. So to diagnose those, you also need uh, chips. So, it's, so chips are basically everywhere. So if you look into the chip industry, how, where we're heading, so in two th just in the one year, in 2020, we shipped one trillion chips. That's basically 130 chips for every human being. And if you look at the sales, it's a 450 billion US dollar in sales, which is the increment from a 300 billion from 2007 to 400 uh, in 2017. And now we are, it's, it's basically a booming industry. So what kind of trend we have? So why we need so many chips? What, what we're doing with it? Uh, one of the key trends, as I mentioned, is the automotive technology. So, uh, so we need sensors. You see a car here, you need sensors everywhere for like parking assistance, uh, emergency braking. So we have to sense what is happening in the surrounding, in the environment, and in the traffic, and you have to react quickly. So you need uh, microchips to calculate, uh, do some calculation very quickly and reliably, and uh, act accordingly. And for that, we need uh, high quality uh, microchips. Another key trend is connectivity. So, uh, so we're moving from uh, 4G to 5G, which means we need to, uh, we can support a lot of bandwidth. So for example, a time to download a two hour movie on your smartphone with 5G will only take a few seconds. And remember previously when, when downloading things, uh, like for example, uh, 56 kbps modem, you have to wait uh, hours until you get to uh, hear any voice or download anything. Not anymore. So with 5G, uh, you get a, a huge amount of bandwidth and a very uh, low latency. Uh, so if you look into the amount of data we are generating, 
so we are predicting by 2025, there will be 175 zettabyte of data. So that's that's a huge amount of data. So zettabyte is, uh, uh, is, is, is a huge amount of data we are generating and why? Because if you look into the uh, time over the production unit, so initially like in 1970s, we had mainframe computing. So like multiple people working in one machine. It's a huge machine and uh, just to operate, you need to have a lot of knowledge, a lot of expertise to operate that. Uh, we did not produce that many of the mainframes, right? So that's the curve here because in the y-axis, we have the number of productive unit. We produce only a few. Then gradually we switch to personal computing. So we have one person to one machine. Uh, then that continued, still it's continuing, but like in the beginning of 2000, we are switching to mobile computing. And there we can have like one person to multiple machines. Uh, then the new trend would be uh, ubiquitous computing. So internet of things and all these uh, smart devices connecting and talking to each other. So for that, we need really high performance computing. Yeah? So all these cars, if uh, they have to talk to each other, they need a very high performance computational power. We call it ubiquitous computing. So multiple machines to multiple machines. And to be able to do that, we need huge amount of uh, data. So basically it's a cycle. So it begins with a very high volume and low cost semiconductor. So something that is affordable, something that is uh, can be accessed by everyone. Like this a mobile phone, for example. So we collect data. And we need ultra fast and high bandwidth network infrastructure right, to, to transfer those data. We have to store it somewhere in the cloud maybe. So that's, we need a huge amount of storage capacity. And then to, uh, to make decisions and uh, process them, we need a high computing power. So this cycle basically driving us to get uh, a high amount of microchips because the production unit is exploding and also high performing microchips. Okay, coming to Moore's law. So in 1965, uh, Gordon Moore, uh, who was back then, uh, I think the DNA director, the research and uh, development director in uh, Fairchild Semiconductor, he was asked to uh, give a paper to uh, electronics uh, magazine. So uh, he wrote a paper and he predicted uh, the number of components per integrated function will will uh, will double every year. So basically, the number of transistor, which is the building block block of any microchips, has to double every year. So he just trying to uh, extrapolate or predict it, uh, what the industry is driving us. Back then, like in 1960s, we had the invention of uh, MOSFET, so that enable us to really go uh, uh, more integrated and that we can scale the device uh, to a smaller uh, size. Uh, so later on, this, this law was uh, corrected, adjusted to two years, uh, and that trend continued for more than four to five decades. And here I'm showing the, the number of transistor count uh, with the date of introduction. So like this 4004 uh, microprocessor had only 2,300 transistor, and two days, uh, Pentium or Core i7, uh, eight core, whatever, they contain uh, more than billion transistors. So the number of transistor increased, but not the size of the, the full chip. That means we need a smaller transistor. Actually, Moore's law is not really like a physics law. It's a law of economics. What does it mean? Imagine we're trying to print this book, this Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. This book contains 227 pages, a certain font size, 14. What you can do if you shrink all the text to the font size of seven and check, okay, how the Moore's law actually work. So what you did, you halved the cost to print the book, right? Because now you have only 114 pages. You have the time to print the book because you need to print a smaller amount of pages, but you doubled the information density of the book. That's where the Moore's law comes in, basically. So it, it, it condensed information in, in a smaller uh, area. So uh, if you look into the price of uh, uh, flash or uh, uh, memory, initially, like the beginning of 2000, it was like $100 per gigabytes, right? Very expensive. You cannot think to buy a gigabyte uh, flash drive back then. 
But nowadays, if you look into the price per gigabyte, it's only a 10 cent. Now we can afford to buy maybe one terabyte flash drive. So that means Moore's law makes chips cheaper. 1976, Cray One was the first supercomputer. Uh, state of the art machine, eight megabytes of memory. Uh, back then it was a huge amount, eight megabytes, wow. The weight was like 5.5 ton, way of an ele elephant. And to, to cool it down, you need this very special uh, cooling system. So to, uh, you need huge amount of power, 150 kilowatt. And with that power, you can, you can uh, that is enough to, uh, for uh, 50 houses. A bit expensive, almost $8.8 .8 million. Nowadays, it would be $30 million. So pretty state-of-the-art machines, but uh, for us, it's hard to access eh, because it's super expensive. OK, and you, what you get, you get 8 megabytes of memory. And the supercomputer in your pocket. Eh, so uh, that's a fraction of the real price and power consumption. So you get more but less. Another example, IBM 5150. So on the on the left, I'm showing the specifications of IBM 5150. Also a state of the art machine. So it's a personal computer. For example, it had a, a memory of 265 kilobyte. So people can buy it. It's not a supercomputer. So they could buy it. They had a floppy disk. Uh, pretty poor resolution, but if you look into Apple iPhone, to higher, and the cost is way cheaper. So the electronic device is getting more and more powerful. What is the key to the Moore's law? So if you look into the first integrated circuits on silicon, so uh, so microchip means you like to integrate a function into a specific area. Uh, so the way for as of a fingernail here. So that's just one uh, transistor. But if you look at the two-day transistor in the same size, we have more than a billion transistor on the same area. So basically, the chip size did not increase, but the number of transistor within a chip uh, increased by million. That means we need smaller transistor. Uh, you can ask, okay, why not uh, the size of the chips increase? So if you increase the size of the chip, uh, it's it's difficult to maintain the yield. And yield means number of good chip power wafer. So uh, the chip producer, they like to keep the chip size the same, and they like to condense the number of transistor in, in, in a smaller area. So that's the main trend that is happening. So we are shrinking and shrinking. So over the last four decades, we are doing that. So things was looking good. Things uh, performance getting better and better. Things get cheaper. But people began to think, OK, so we're reaching to the uh, physical limit. Like, OK, we are now the transistor size is like uh, tens of nanometers. So uh, it's closing like only a few silicon atoms. So how far that you can go? So people think, OK, no exponential law should, should uh, stay forever. So a lot of uh, fuzz. So people say, OK, the most law is coming to an end. Uh, in, in a lot of magazines, just a screenshot. By the way, this screenshot was like 2014 or so. So they were thinking maybe Moore's law has to stop. We cannot uh, shrink anymore. Is it true? So it was uh, driving the industry for the last four decades. So to make microchips, you know, like a lot of uh, uh, manufacturer has to uh, work together. So it's not only lithography, but also etching, deposition tool, uh, implantation tool, uh, so a lot of things has to come together. So Moore's law gives them the cadence, the heartbeat to work together. So they have a, a target to work with, so we can work together. So why it should suddenly stop now? It was going so well, why it should stop now? So here I'm showing uh, again a timeline and the calculation per second per thousand dollars. So because at the end, we like to make microchips in a cost effective way. So if it gets too complex, the price get high then the Moore's law doesn't work anymore. So it's not only about the shrink, but to be able to shrink with good performance and in a cheaper cost. So we have to maintain both. So then coming back to the question, why should it suddenly stop now, right? Because we still have a multi-decade device roadmap. So the demand is there. So we have ideas still to continue further. For example, if you cannot work with a 2D planar transistor, you can go to 3D. 
So a regular CMOS geometric scaling might not help, but you need a bit of architectural change, which will enable the need of shrink even further. Uh, people are working with photonics chip. People are working with the carbon nanotubes. Lawrence Barclay, they showed one nanometer transistors. So we have a lot of uh, device roadmap, uh, which needs the shrink. So Intel, they call it a, a TikTok. Uh, tick means you get an architectural change. So you, 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 you bring the performance so that uh, you change the architecture so the performance can continue. And then you need the talk, and talk is the shrink. So TikTok has to continue together, basically. So what I'm trying to say here is we have substantial performance gain next to the geometrical scaling because of this architectural change. So we need them together. Uh, what does it really mean? So. Uh, in a conventional 2D planar MOSFET. So as I mentioned to you from 1960, the MOSFET was invented and it was driving the scaling. So you can just shrink uh, the, the structures and performance get to improve. So here I'm just showing a basic structure of a MOSFET. Uh, how a MOSFET works. So you have a source, drain and a gate, and you need to form a channel between source and the drain. You can think of it like a water tap analogy. So the gate is the control which controls when you get conduction from source to grain. So you apply a voltage on the gate, and then uh, depending on the uh, threshold, you could have a nice conducting channels. So transistors essentially is a switch. Yeah? So you have to switch on and off. If you can make the channel shorter, that means you need less electrons or holes, depending on which carrier you're going to use, to form a conduction. So basically, you need less voltage. Less voltage, less power consumption. Power consumption, that's one of the other important aspects of transistors. So when you like to switch a transistor from on to off, uh, what you call is a dynamic power. Right? So, uh, so essentially, MOSFET, you, you form a capacitance here, right? because uh, in between the gate electrode, and the substrate here, you have a uh, oxide layer, it's an insulator. So essentially, you're forming a capacitance. If you can reduce the area, you get less capacitance. So to charge this capacitor, uh, you, can, you can charge and discharge faster. That means uh, the power is proportional to this uh, capacitance. What you can also do, you can increase the clock frequency. So you can, uh, uh, since you're reducing capacitance, you have more room to increase the clock frequency. And this uh, threshold voltage, you can also reduce. So you can make them conduct at a small voltage. That means power consumption is less. Less power, less money you have to pay. Huh? That's less heating. So uh, you can see that why this uh, from uh, moving from uh, this Cray-1 supercomputer to a mobile phone, uh, it gets cheaper because of this less power consumption. It gets faster, so you get more performance. But life is not bad of roses, right? So you don't get anything for free. If you make the, this, this uh, oxide layer thinner, you have problem with the leakage current. So the dynamic power, you are reducing it, but the static power, so when you're not switching, you're you are static. So at offset, your static power is increasing because you have a leakage current still flowing between the source and the drain. Not so nice. So you're losing a bit of power. Right? Uh, it cannot shrink anymore. So uh, you, if you just keep going on with the 2D planner MOSFET, shrink kind of stopping, so it's not so nice. So why not switch to another architecture? It's called FinFET. You remember the, the jaws, so the, so the shark uh, movie? So you have the fins on the top of the shark, so it's like this kind of structure. So it's the source and the drain is not in a 2D structure anymore, but it's protrude like a fin, and it goes through the gate. So the gate is surrounding this source to drain channels. So previously, you had uh, electron flowing just in uh, below this get, just one surface, right? But now you have three surfaces. So just below the get, and then on the right, and on the left. So if you think of this channel as a road, now you have three lengths for the electrons to flow. And you have better control of this leakage. So you can, you can increase the drive strength. Drive strength means you can flow uh, more electrons. And it can improve the switching speed. That means I can now shrink the channel again 
using this architecture, that means I need a better lithography or patterning technology. That's nice. So we get the 3D architecture. So we are we are getting stuck by the 2D planner. We switch to 3D. Things begin to improve. Nice. So if you look into the logic device and the shrink roadmap, um, so example here, I'm showing a timeline again, and what kind of architecture we are thinking. Uh, so for planner, like up to 32 nanometer, you say, okay, I'm getting close to the limit. I cannot improve it anymore because the whole idea is to improve the performance at cheaper cost. Switching to FinFET uh, with uh, 14 nanometer FinFET, uh, we could reach a certain performance. So here in this graph, what I'm showing is get length uh, versus the switching threshold. So this voltage that is needed to form a conduction channel. So with 14 nanometer fin fat, uh, you need a certain uh, 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 switching threshold, right? But if you began to decrease the get length, so going from right to the left, you need more voltage doesn't help me, right? Because I need then more power. So why not switch from this red curve to the blue one? So why not reduce the, the width even further to five nanometer? Here you see, I now I need less switching threshold. That means less power. But if I shrink further, again, the same problem that uh, at some point the leakage began to uh, dominate and also the switching threshold began to increase. So that's also not so nice. So then we switch to another technology. Uh, so get all around uh, uh, transistors. So for that, you have technologies like uh, nanowires. So uh, so here, by the way, for the fin fed, you can also have multiple fins to get even uh, further improvement. But at some point, it, it also began to uh, be limiting. So for uh, nanowires, uh, if, you, if you do nanowires, the, the nice thing is you can enable shrink further. You can see that I'm decreasing the get length and this switching threshold is not increasing that much yet. That's nice. So every time we get stuck by the uh, limit, we switch to another architecture to push the technology forward. So when you cannot do it anymore with horizontal nanoware, you can switch to vertical nanoware. And even uh, Lawrence Berkeley lab, lab, they showed one nanometer transistor using carbon nanotubes. So we have the potential to go even smaller transistors. That means we have we have the need to have better lithography technique. Uh, so here I'm showing just four uh, engines, let's call it, four engines to enable uh, or to support the Moore's law. So first one is the geometrical scaling. So just 2D shrink through patterning, that's the lithography. That's where the uh, companies like ASML comes in. We have the circuit scaling, so we put more function on the chip with advanced packaging and system on chip. That also helps with the continuity of the Moore's law. I already talked about the device scaling, so you get new structure or even new materials. For example, if you switch from this silicon dioxide to high K material, you can support uh, a, a smaller get length. Also, architectural scaling. So all these four items together, it supports Moore's law. Moore's law. We need all four of them. It, it has to complement each other. Another way to put it, uh, so uh, it's like we have three complementary axes. So the logic scaling, logic means the, the, the circuits that you are painting. So like dimensional scaling, lithography, device scaling, and layout scaling. And on the other hand, you can do something in 3D uh, to get a better form factor and functionality but you also need software and, and hardware they have to support each other so all this ingredient together we can keep continuing more slow okay let's continue so, so far we discussed about the need of shrink so how the what is the market trend and how the shrink can still continue more slow so more slow is far from being end so we have still a lot of challenges but also we have a lot of ideas to move on uh, I'd like to introduce ASML. So uh, what we do, so ASML is a, is a Dutch, Dutch company. So came from uh, 1984 from uh, Philips. Uh, so back then, it uh, uh, started in a, in a small garage in, uh, in, uh, in the beside Philips uh, campus. So what we do, we make 
lithography tool. Lithography tool making use of light. So it's a photolithography tool. So lithography is the one of the most critical tool for producing chips. I'm talking about the chips, which we don't need, but the microchips. Uh, so we are the market leader of producing these machines, uh, market share over 80%. So 2020, the net sales was huge. So it basically, it's a huge company because industry is booming. Everyone needs chips, which means we also need lithographic tool. So in short, ASML makes the machines for making those chips. So we don't make the chips ourselves. We sell it to our customer, uh, which is used uh, by them to make the chips. Uh, so basically, this is our campus. So all major chip makers, they use ASML technology. Uh, here you see this area here. This is our clean room. This was for DPV, uh, deep ultraviolet uh, patterning technology. Uh, this is a bit older picture. So in this area here, now they turn into a clean room for uh, fabrication or fab for UV. So it's a huge area where we produce uh, UV machines. And we spend a lot in R&D, basically, because the, the key behind our success is the innovation. And to innovate, we have to keep uh, doing the research. Yeah, it's, it has a global presence. We have office all around the world. So wherever we have customers, we have offices. Uh, so uh, the companies who buys our chip, so you probably never heard of ASML because uh, yeah, we are uh, uh, not in the consumer, directly consumer market. So the consumer doesn't buy our machine, but the companies like Samsung, TSMC or Intel or Micron, they buy our machines and they make the chips. So all the major chip makers, they're our customers. So there's a high chance, whatever uh, electronic device you're using uh, for yourself or at your home, there's a high chance it is made by ASML machine. So uh, that's the fundamental of making any microchips. Uh, the type of chips, you can basically split into three, three kinds of chips. Eh? You have the logic, uh, the microprocessors, so company like Intel, they make processors. You have uh, a flash memory, so like uh, solid state uh, hard disk, sol solid state devices and you have the DRAM eh, for the volatile memories. So all these companies, they make those kind of microchips. Uh, TSMC, that's a Taiwanese company. It's a bit special because what we call here, it's called a foundry. So foundry means uh, because to make a fab, it's a huge expensive work. So what they do, like other fabless company, for example, Apple or Huawei, eh, so they don't have the fab themselves. So they give the design to TSMC and they make the chips for them because you have to keep the machine up and running uh, and more volume you have, so more uh, units you can make, more profit you can uh, do. Uh, how lithography works. Okay. So uh, you can think of it like if you're old enough to know the, the photo cameras or the film cameras, you know how lithography works actually. So basically you have a negative, uh, so which you like to print on photo paper, and for lithography, you have a circuit pattern on a reticle or, or a mask, you call it. So it's a blueprint. So the reticle contains the blueprint and you shine a laser light through the blueprint and, and print that blueprint on a wafer, which has a photosensitive element called photoresist. So it's like printing a circuit pattern on silicon wafers. Sounds easy. Uh, not so much, actually. It's a highly complicated machine. So I will go a bit uh, deeper uh, to show it. Let me see. I need my mouse pointer. So let's go inside uh, of a, a lithography tool. So of course, things begin with light huh? because we're doing photolithography. There is another kind of lithography. It's called e-beam, but here we're using light because with light, we can make printing way faster. Uh, so uh, things begin with light, so it's a laser source, and you have to guide that light uh, from the source up to the reticle, which contains the, the blueprint, the circuit pattern that you like to print. And to guide that, you need an illumination system, because you have to illuminate this mask uniformly with light. And for that, you have this uh, number of uh, lenses or mirrors, depending on what kind of design we're talking about. Uh, this 
blueprint is sitting on a stage called radical stage. It has to move right? because you have a certain pattern and you have to switch from one pattern to the other. And then you have a projection lens to image that uh, pattern onto the wafer, which is like a silicone pizza, 300 millimeter. And that, that thing is moving around and you're printing this blueprint onto the wafer. This is in a nutshell how lithography uh, works. Yeah. Uh, the machine is called a twin scan machine because it has two stage in the wafer stage. So when one wafer is getting exposed, the other wafer is being measured because wafer has a certain topology. It can have some height difference. So you like to measure the wafer first before exposing it with laser light. Okay. Uh, if, you, if we zoom in into a chip, we can see that a chip is actually made of dozens of layers. So I'm just zooming in into one of the core of a, uh, of a chip. Uh, so a silicon wafer contains like hundreds of those uh, chips. You can also call it a die. Uh, so to make those chips functional, you need actually uh, multiple layers. So if you zoom in further, like in nanometer scale, you will see a whole new world uh, coming into your view. So it's more like a multi-story building, but miniature in nanometer scale. So each layer has a certain function and all together, they give you the complete uh, device uh, performance. So basically when you're making this building, you have to align this layer pretty accurately. Otherwise, uh, the building will collapse, right? So you have the pillars, let's call it here. So we have the contacts, the metal contacts. And each layer, you have to align it very well. So this alignment is called overlay. So if you don't have good overlay, although you're printing it pretty well, things will collapse. So you have to maintain a good performing uh, overlay when you're printing them. Uh, if you look at the semiconductor manufacturing loop, and the tool we are making, that's the scanner or the lithography tool. It's also called a scanner because you're scanning through the wafer. That's not the only tool that you need. So it's, it's one of the many tools which is needed to make the, the final product. So things begin, of course, with the silicon wafer. So you have to coat it with the photoregist to make it sensitive uh, to light. Um, then you expose. So you choose which layer you like to uh, uh, make it uh, softer so that later on you can develop and take them out through etching. Silicon itself, so silicon is the most abundant material in, in the art, right? So we have plenty, it's basically sand. It's, we have plenty of silicons, but silicon itself uh, cannot do the trick. So we have to dope it. And for that, you need ion implantation to dope it. So to make it N-type or P-type, you dope it with this uh, machine. This machine we don't make. So in the fab, in the customer fab, they buy our lithography tool and also they have to buy each of these. So the wafer is traveling around. So wafer is going through different steps. Uh, then afterwards, you have to remove the photoregist, which was assisting you to print your pattern. You have to process it. Then this loop continues to the next layer. Uh, to be able to do it correct, you need also uh, softwares. So you need computational lithography. So you need to know what kind of mask uh, and what kind of light source you need to enable a sharp feature to print them correctly. We call it source mask optimization. Source means uh, is the angular distribution of light and what kind of uh, source you need, or we call it also pupil, what kind of people you need to match with the mask to get a nice pattern on the wafer. But you also need metrology and inspection. And for that, we have separate. So this guy is called the twin scan scanner. And we also have Yale star, which is used to measure it. So you print it on the wafer, but how good you did your job, you have to check it through this metrology tool. And also we have e-beam inspection tool to get even better resolutions. Uh, how the imaging process works. So how, how we actually print a circuit pattern on the wafer. So I will go a bit more detail here. And by the way, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat. So uh, 
I hope uh, Mainul can still forward to me or we can also do it at the end of the session. Yeah, actually, I uh, just uh, wanted to interrupt. Our uh, first speaker is also here. So we can, oh, nice. uh, after your talk, I think we'll give the floor to Anisul Hock, Professor Anisul Hock, sir, and then uh, we can take okay. the quest questions together later. Yeah, okay, perfect. So how much Thank time you. I have, Mainul? Uh, uh, how maybe you can finish in the next five, 10 minutes. If Okay. Yeah, let's uh, let's try to do it in 10 minutes. So I don't have yeah. many slides left. So the essence yeah. is already there. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So now I will go deeper into UV lithography. So how UV is helping us basically. So here we have a light source and we're trying to uh, uh, print the circuit pattern on the wafer, right? So what will happen because it's a very uh, tiny structures, light will diffract uh, into multiple diffraction orders. You have the zero order, plus one, minus one, plus two, and so on. And with this uh, projection lens, we're going to image this pattern on the wafer. Uh, the thing is, uh, if you look at the zero order, it only contains intensity information. It doesn't have any information about this pitch, this P. So we need at least one diffraction order to be present to get information about this pitch. But you can imagine, uh, this angle is getting, uh, for the high order, getting bigger and bigger. So question, what happens if the P gets even smaller? And question number two, is the image pattern also a square? So uh, if the pitch get even smaller, basically what happens is that due to diffraction law, if the pitch is small, this angle gets bigger which means I need a bigger lens to capture it. A lens is basically a Fourier transformer. So this, uh, let's say a square wave contain a lot of frequencies, but the lens is like a Fourier filter. I cannot capture all the frequencies. So at the end, uh, I will miss some frequency and the image will be a bit blurred. But as long as I can separate the peaks, I can still print it. So the lens has to be big to make sharper feature. So the people who are familiar with photography, they know this F number. Uh, in lithography, we call it a NA, a numerical aperture, which is basically like one over the F number. So uh, I need to capture a bigger angle. So I need a bigger lens. So this D is the diameter, and this is the ratio of diameter and the focal length. And you'll never get uh, as sharp as you have here. You will lose a bit of information, but as long as you can distinguish, you're still fine. So the resolution is driven by the wavelength and the NA. How? This is the key formula for lithography. So this is the critical dimension. So the smallest feature you can print on the wafer. So nowadays you see uh, industries driving from one node to the other. So initially node meant, okay, the, the channel length. But nowadays uh, the node value doesn't directly mean the get channel length because of the architectural change. But here I'm talking about really the smallest feature you can print. The resolution basically. There's a ratio of the wavelength and this sine theta, which is basically the numerical aperture. You have this process factor also playing a role, the K1. Uh, so this guy is the numerical aperture. So if you have a bigger numerical aperture or a bigger lens, you can print smaller uh, critical dimension. Or if you can reduce the wavelength, the lambda, you can also print a smaller uh, uh, critical dimension. Uh, what is actually wavelength? So think about like you're trying to draw eyelashes of beautiful Mona Lisa. They're very fine eyelashes, right? So if you're trying to draw it with, uh, with, a, with, a with a big brush, which you use it for painting your house, you cannot really draw these eyelashes, right? So you need much finer brush to draw it. So wavelength is like the brush you like to use to, 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 uh, to print something. So initially we begin with, uh, for the old systems, with uh, visible light. And then gradually we are switching to smaller and smaller wavelengths. So this extreme ultraviolet lithography is using 13.5 nanometer wavelengths. That's the big jump coming from uh, immersion lithography, which is using 193 nanometer. It's also known as deep UV uh, or deep ultraviolet lithography. So here you get a huge benefit. You're switching uh, like factor 13 uh, smaller wavelength, but also the numerical aperture that's also very important. So this immersion lithography that I meant here is uh, using as a last lens element, water, immersion. 
So sine theta, you all know that the biggest value of sine theta is one. Right? You cannot go beyond one. So, but for numerical aperture, actually you can go beyond one because it's actually refractive index multiplied by sine theta. So if you can put water, you, you're going beyond refractive index of one for air, you can make it a bigger NA. So for immersion lithograph, you have an NA of 1.35, which helps to print smaller feature. Uh, for UV, although we gain a factor 13 in wavelength, you cannot uh, make a UV machine uh, with water because uh, everything absorbs UV. Eh? You cannot even use a lens uh, because a glass surface will absorb UV. So we have to use mirrors and we have to keep the machine in vacuum. So that's also a big challenge switching to UV. So UV has crisper resolution, so we can uh, put a lot of information in a smaller uh, uh, area for example if you like to use this 13 nanometer resolution of uv you can print the lord of the rings trilogy in one a4 paper but like almost 3000 times so that's that's a, about the resolution that you can get uh, so for dimensional scaling uv is crucial as i mentioned to you we need multiple layers huh, to get the function uh, you can still use immersion lithography using a deep UV wavelength, 193 nanometer, but you need more complex process. So for example, for 20 nanometer node, you need eight litho steps. If you remember that the process cycle I told you, I showed to you, you, uh, you, uh, you expose, you coat, you deposit again, you expose again. So you need eight steps for litho. And uh, for metrology, every time you uh, do litho, you also have to measure. So that also takes time. So if you uh, keep, keep using immersion lithography and switching to a smaller node, you see how the complexity is increasing for every layers. So you need a lot of litho steps and uh, you need a lot of time to measure it. UV makes life way easier. So switching to seven nanometer, we only need uh, eight litho steps instead of 33 with immersion. So, it reduces the complexity and also means the time to market, which is essential because for this industry, like every Christmas, people like to have your new iPhone, right? That means time to market is very important. So you have to do things uh, pretty quick. So UV makes life easier because you need less steps to make the microchips. Uh, at the end, the chip performance is all about the electrical characteristic, right? So uh, if you have like higher contact resistance, uh, you have more power dissipations and the circuits uh, get delays, eh? so a lower clock frequency. So the higher resolution of UV allows to make bigger contact path without risk of short circuiting, which results in significantly lower contact resistance. So the left is, is a bit of uh, resolution is not so good here, but left is UV, right is immersion. You see the resistance in the y-axis, you get lower resistance and also less variability. Again, left is UV, right is immersion. And also all these layers by using, you can uh, simplify it and make it in one steps. You don't need all these layers. You can just do it in, in one step. And it's here. So after uh, 20 years of R&D, uh, UV is finally uh, reached volume. So it's up and running and you're already having UV product at your hand. So like the Samsung uh, Exynos uh, processor, it's, and they're using UV. And actually they're advertising that they're using UV which is actually pretty nice. Huh? Uh, also for uh, Huawei, for 5G chips and Apple, they're also all switching to five nanometer uh, UV process. Uh, if you look into Samsung infographic news, they're uh, already telling that UV is improving the efficiency, the performance and power consumption. Here is a nice picture you see with the argon fluoride, which is 193 DPV laser. You see this kind of resolution. With UV, you can print way sharper. And also the mask layer, they are decreasing. Uh, number of wafer exposed to UV is also growing uh, rapidly. So uh, now we have six, 26 cumulative wafers that are exposed with UV. So UV is the workhorse nowadays. So when I, we were doing R&D uh, for UV, people told our salary is paid by DPV because we could not sell much machines. But nowadays, the story is different. So UV is bringing the main workhorse now, nowadays. So this, this kind of specification we have, so the NA or the numerical aperture as I explained to you is 0.33. So with EUV, we have to use mirror optics, so you cannot go like 1.35. Uh, 
Wave length is 13.5, resolution is 13. And this kind of throughput we have. And throughput is all about money. Uh, but you have to still maintain good performance. So you have to print a millions of good patterns in the regist. Then you have to interconnect all these layers. And you have to do it 24-7 for thousands of wafers per day. You have to keep this critical dimension well uniform and also these multiple layers aligned within one nanometer. That's a tough job. But uh, we, are, we are there. We are doing it quite, uh, quite well. I will skip this one. In the past, we move uh, from uh, a stepper system into a twin scan, which gave us more uh, throughput and better resolution and uh, wafer per hour. Now we're switching to uh, EUV. So these machines, uh, they are called NXE machines. So for deep UV also, there was major breakthrough using this immersion lithography. But now with EUV, we have the next big uh, challenge, that's the high NA. So switching from 0.33 to 0.55. Uh, so the relative cost per pixel is decreasing, but if you look into uh, the complexity, technology-wise, we had to move mountains. So it seems impossible at the beginning until we did it. So the complexity is increasing. Immersion, I already talked about it. So the key changes for deep UV lithography. So we have a new light source. It's a laser-produced plasma source. We cannot use glasses anymore because glass will absorb UV light. We have to switch to mirrors and things are in vacuum. So we have to maintain a good vacuum basically. So the source is here. You have the illuminator, the lens, the very fast radical stage and wafer stage. Uh, in UV, everything is bigger. So we have more than 100,000 parts. It's pretty uh, heavy. So weighing 180 ton, that's of 140 mini coopers. And you have to, uh, when you ship this machine, uh, we need uh, three uh, 747. So that's a huge uh, machine, also very pretty expensive, more than 120 million euro. But when the customer use the machine, they, make the, they can uh, come up with the profit uh, pretty quickly. Uh, introduction to the UV source. So UV is using a laser produced plasma source. So we have a CO2 laser, a gas laser, which is hitting a tiny tin droplets, which is falling like 50,000 times per second. If you do that, the tin will turn into plasma and it will generate UV. So we collect the light and we throw it to the scanner, which has this illuminator lens, radical stage, wafer stage. Uh, how we do it, I will first show a picture. So basically you have the tin droplet coming in, uh, tiny, like a 30 micrometer. So first you shoot it with a pre-pulse. So basically uh, pre-pulse will turn this tiny tin droplet into a bigger target, like a pancake. And then we shoot with the main pulse. And then this pancake is turning into plasma. And when you turn it into plasma, what happens, uh, this, these electrons will absorb this uh, infrared photons. It's, it's become very hot. It will excite the ions, and these ions will emit UV. So you have the pre-pulse here and the main pulse, uh, and you have to maintain this beam well aligned to this droplet. Otherwise, you don't get UV, but you get tin debris. Tin will give uh, not only UV light, 13.5, but also other wavelengths. So we have mirrors to filter it. So we have spectral purity filter to only catch 13.5. So this 13.5 in UV is driven by the optics technology. I will skip all this. Uh, so the mirror, they have to be polished to sub-nanometer accuracy. Because uh, the wavelength is so small, if you get any small bump, you're going to print those bump on the wafer. Right? And you have to maintain this beam and this machine uh, very stable. So this mirror, they have multi-layer coatings with molybdenum and silicon. It's acting like a thin film interference. So light, a bit of light goes through and at each surface it reflects. And here they have to interfere constructively. In that way you can get more reflectivity. But still it's like 65% reflectivity for each mirrors. So you can imagine at every mirror you hit, after you put so much effort to create this UV, you're gonna lose a bit of light. So the light that you generate here is something like 350 watt, but the light that is end up in the wafer is only like one watt or two watt. 
Uh, Clean vacuum already mentioned that. So the next big hurdle, next big challenge is to increase the NA. So then there's the high NA lithography. So uh, there, what is shown here is basically uh, we need to maintain a good accuracy. So smaller uh, bump in the mirrors, it has to be very uniform and it has to be big. And in this kind of optics like contact lens or cameras or uh, beamer, it's pretty easy because uh, the size is not that big and the accuracy needed is not that big. But now we have to make it like in picometer accuracy. So if we scale a mirror to the size of California, the biggest mountain that you can allow is only 51 micrometer. That's pretty difficult, but we are doing it together with Zeiss, Carl Zeiss, that's a German company. So we're making uh, big mirrors in these big machines. So we're getting there. Uh, that come to my last slide. So to summarize, we have an endless market uh, for the need for, for devices, for application, for data and algorithms. And we have a lithography roadmap, uh, which is extended with UV. It's running in production. So it's happening at the moment. Uh, to continue the Moore's law, we have to uh, increase the numerical aperture of the lenses. And for that, we have in the roadmap 0.55 NA or the high NA lithography. Uh, we cannot do it alone. This extension has to be combined with other technologies like the improvement also in the resist. So together with our customers, partner and supplier, we can continue to play a critical role. So together we can keep continuing the more slow at least for uh, several decades to come. So there is no stopping basically. I think uh, that's it for today. Maybe uh, I can show a bit of metaphor. The critical stage that we have is acceleration of 150 meter per second. It means if you're driving a sports car, you only need 0.18 second to go from zero to 100 kilometer per hour. That's how fast our radical stage is. Uh, this one is pretty cool. So uh, with our UV lithography system, we have to shine a light very accurate. Yeah? It's like hitting a 50 euro cent from the earth to the moon. That's how good the alignment has to be. I think uh, that's it for today. Thank you all for your attention. So if you have questions, we will have a QA session afterwards. I think we now we can switch to uh, the next talk by Dr. Anisul Hawk. Thank Thanks you, a lot. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you so much, Yasin Bhai. It was a wonderful talk. And it's good to see that UV has come a long way. And uh, I was there when uh, Global Foundries first installed their UUV2. I was working in their metrology R&D there as well. And we were always talking about throughput and all. And it's good to see that it has come a long way in the past three years. Okay, so yep. uh, we are very excited to have uh, Professor Anisulok sir with us. Uh, and we are very happy that uh, he, he joined us despite some uh, emergency that we had earlier today. So uh, with uh, no further delay, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Anisulak sir, who is an IEEE EDS distinguished lecturer to actually uh, deliver his talk on the journey of the transistors. Uh, sorry if you're here. Yeah. Okay, Mainul, uh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And I apologize that I could not be present at the scheduled time. I had an unforeseen family emergency. Actually, even now I'm making the presentation uh, uh, from my car, uh, a part at a hospital emergency. So please bear with me. Uh, can you uh, see the slides? Yeah, 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 we can see the slides, sir. Yeah. Okay. Just a minute. Okay, so today's title is Journey of the Transistor. I will tell the historical development of the development of the transistor, particularly MOSFET. Although the title says transistor, I won't discuss all transistors. There are at least 
three, four major types are focused mainly on the MOSFET. This is the outline of my presentation. First, I'll introduce the basic MOSFET structures, assuming that everyone may not be familiar with the device. Then I will describe the brief history. Then what are the scaling issues related to mass MOSFETs? What is the present status of the device? And what are the possible future directions? Okay. This diagram shows the schematic structure of the MOSFET. We have uh, a silicon or semiconductor substrate to doped region source and the drain, and we have the channel in between. The channel is covered by an insulator of thickness T. On top of the insulator, we have the so-called metal gate. And if we apply a voltage between source and drain, and if the gate voltage is such that the transistor is on, a current will flow through the channel between source and drain, and the current can be described by this equation. Here, W is the width of the channel, L is the length of the channel, VGS is the gate voltage, and VT is the threshold voltage. There are two parameters, mu and Cox. Mu is mobility, which is the material parameter, and Cox is the capacitance associated with the oxide. The capacitance can be expressed by this expression where K is the dielectric constant. So if we compare these two equations, we can see that if I make L smaller, the drain current will increase. If I make the oxide thickness smaller, the drain current is. So by reducing the channel length and by reducing the oxide thickness, the drain current can be increased. And this principle is the fundamental physics behind the geometrical scaling that has driven the semiconductor industry for nearly five decades. The history of MOSFETs began in 1928 when Lilienfeld filed the first patent on a MOSFET. That was a theoretical idea, and he proposed that Cu2S may be used as the semiconductor, aluminum oxide as the oxide layer, and according to his idea, aluminum could be the gate metal. However, we will soon see that actual fabrication of the MOSFET was much complicated than Lilienfeld anticipated. The first transistor, which became reality, is interestingly not the MOSFET, although that was the first idea, rather bipolar point contact transistor is the first real transistor that was developed in 1947. Actually, that was an accident. This transistor was not developed as a plan, rather it was a result of an unexpected outcome in an experiment. In the later year, Shockley developed on the bipolar point contact transistor and invented the full-fledged DJT. And from 1947, the era of semiconductors started. In 1958, about a decade later, Kilby at Texas Instruments demonstrated the first integrated circuit using germanium substrate. However, we should note that the process used by Kilby was never used in an actual industry. This was only used to prove the concept. The first integrated circuit that was commercially viable was developed by Robert Noyes, who is one of the co-founders of Intel. In 1960, he made the first silicon monolithic integrated circuit, which was commercially viable. And in the same year, another very important incident happened. The first working MOSFET was demonstrated in 1960 as well. So after 32 years, 
of Lilienfeld's patent, the first MOSFET became a reality. And this became successful because Atala and Kang, they used silicon and silicon dioxide as the semiconductor and the oxide. This resulted in good interface with very low defect density. Actually, the high defect density between oxide and the semiconductor was responsible for not making successful MOSFETs before. Okay. Then, in 1965, only five years after the invention of the real MOSFET, Gordon Moore, who is also a co-founder of Intel, proposed his famous scaling law, which is now known as the Moore's law. According to Moore's law, the number of transistors in every chip doubles in every technology generation. Depending on the time, the technology generation can be 1.5 to 2 years long. As time is going, the generation is getting longer, but initially it was between 1 and 1.5 years. Okay, the five data points Moore used were the five years from 1959 to 1964. So if we look at the Moore's law in graph, we can see that these green five points, these are the original data points that Moore used to make his prediction. And here we have shown the progression until 2010. There are several graphs, graphs for several technologies. The lowest one is for microprocessors, the red one is for memory. And we can also see as time passes, although the increase remains exponential, the exponent becomes smaller. So the increase is getting slightly smaller as time passes by, with the exception of this peak. Okay. It looks very straightforward, but actually this fulfillment of the prophecy of Moore's law had to overcome many technological hurdles. In this brief time, I don't have the uh, scope to touch on every challenges. I will just mention a couple initially and a couple recent challenges. Within the first decade, the metal gate was replaced by self-aligned polysilicon gate at around 1968. And this is one of the first major breakthrough for successful commercial production of MOSFETs with high yield. Then in 1975, lightly doped drain concept was used. This was introduced to reduce the short channel effects. What is short channel effect? We'll talk about that in a few minutes. So during the 80s and during the 90s, the challenges were handled rather straightforwardly and that did not involve any major paradigm shift. The next paradigm shift came in 2002 when the silicon substrate in P channel of the CMOS was strained. So that was Strained silicon is a different material from silicon, and this is the first time that anything other than bulk silicon was used in commercial building of transistors for microprocessors or large-scale memories. Then in 2007, silicon dioxide was replaced by high di gate dielectric, mainly by hafnium oxide, and in 2012, which is of this graph, the planar bulk MOSFET was replaced by FinFET. And we are still in this paradigm. The industry currently is still working with FinFETs. So we can see that the industry has gone through a lot of trouble to keep the scaling law active. If here I have shown the number of transistors per die, it went up from 10 to the power 0 to 10 to the power 10 or 9, which is 
nine orders of magnitude. That's a huge change in about 60 years. So what is the motivation for this scaling? Why is the semiconductor industry aggressively pursuing scaling in spite of all the challenges? First, if we scale, the transistors become smaller, which is obvious. So we can put more number of transistors in a chip. If I can put more number of transistors in a microprocessor chip, I can increase the functionality of the chip. If I can put more transistors in a memory, I can increase the capacity of the memory. So that reduces the cost per function, or if I do not increase the size, then the chip size is reduced. So I can make more number of chips from the same silicon that will reduce the cost of the chip. So either increasing functionality or reduced cost. These are the driving forces of the silicon industry. And if I reduce the transistor size, the RC delay is reduced, so we can operate with a higher clock speed. And we can also reduce the power supply voltage, so the power consumption per transistor is drastically reduced. So these are the advantages of transistor scale. However, Scaling is not only a bed of roses. There are major negative effects of scaling. The most important negative effect is the short channel effect. As we reduce the gate length, that is as we scale the transistor beyond the limit, this is about 100 nanometer limit, beyond 100 nanometer, the threshold voltage begins to decrease drastically with reduced gate length. If the threshold voltage is reduced, then the leakage current or the off state current between the source and the drain increases exponentially. So if we look at the IV characteristics, this is the graph we get. This is the drain current versus gate voltage. The blue one is for the long channel transistor and the red one is the short channel. In the on state, both behaves rather similarly, but in the off state, the behavior is drastically different. For the short channel, the off state current decreases much slowly, meaning that the sub-threshold sub swing of the short channel transistor is bigger. So as we scale beyond 100 nanometer in the short transistors, sub-threshold swing increases, which means that at zero gate voltage, there is a higher leakage current. So scaling makes it more difficult to turn the transistor off. This is a fundamental challenge of scaling. As we scale the transistor, it becomes increasingly more difficult to turn the transistor off by removing the gate voltage. Okay, so what is the physics? behind this negative short channel effect. If we look at the basic structure of a MOSFET, we see that there are three depletion regions. The first depletion region is controlled by the source on the left. The second depletion region on the right is controlled by the drain. And the trapezoidal depletion region in the middle is controlled by the gate. The gate voltage can only control the charge which is within this trapezoidal area. That means these two triangular areas, one near the source end and one near the drain end, these two triangular shaped charge regions cannot be controlled by the gate. Now, when the gate is long, when L is large, these triangles, the areas are very small compared to the area of the trapezoid. So the fraction of the charge that the gate cannot control is small. However, as we decrease the channel length, the areas of these triangles do not reduce, but only the area of the trapezoid reduces. So the fraction of the charge that the gate controls under the gate 
is reduced as the transistor is scaled. So, for this reason, essentially, it becomes more difficult to turn the transistor off because a significant fraction of the charge under the gate is not under the control of the gate. So, in order to have our transistors function effectively, we need to turn it off effectively. So, to do that, we need to give the control of the charge back to the gate. How can we do that? In order to do that, we have to look at different architecture of the transistor. This traditional bulk structure is no longer adequate for scaling. Okay. The first approach is to use silicon on insulator MOSFET. Instead of bulk MOSFET, the source, the drain, and the channel are put on a buried oxide layer. So we do not have any bulk silicon under the active device. What is the difference? In the bulk device, we see a lot of field lines. These arrows represent electric field lines originating from the drain are not getting terminated at the gate. These are fringing fields, and these fringing fields are responsible for weakening the gate control. But in SOI MOSFET, we can see all the electric field lines end in the channel region, which is controlled by the gate. So by putting the active silicon device on an oxide layer, we can improve the gate control. There is another way to control the, improve the control of the gate, that is by using double gate MOSFET. If we put two gates, one on the top and one on the bottom, we can say, see that compared to the bulk MOSFET, the electric field lines are much more streamlined and there is no fringing effects. So we see that we can improve the gate control either by putting the MOSFET on an insulator, silicon on insulator, or by using double gates. So naturally, if we combine these effects, that means if we make double gate MOSFET on silicon on insulator, we will get even more gate control. By increasing the number of gate from two, if we use triple gates or multiple gates, we will have more control of the gates. So these are the current paradigms in transistor scale that the device will be on a oxide layer, buried oxide layer. It will not be supported by bulk silicon. And secondly, we will use many gates to control the channel. Okay. So if we think of that paradigm, this is the conceptual evolution of the MOSFET architecture. We started with the bulk planar MOSFET. Then the next step is the silicon on insulator SOI MOSFET. Then the double gate MOSFET, gate one and gate two. From that, we go to fin fit MOSFET where the gate looks or the channel looks like a fin with gates on three sides. Trigate MOSFET is synonymous with FinFET. Both represent the same architecture. Then by tweaking the gate shape, we can get, make pi shape gate or omega shape gate. But the ultimate target in this evolution is to have gate all around the channel. The channel will be completely surrounded by gate, which we call gate all around. So we started with the bulk planar silicon and we want to end up with gate all around or GAA type architecture. Okay, so these are the present status, the FinFET, Trigate and its variations. So if we look at the present status of the MOSFET, the state of the art transistor in 2021 is the five nanometer node 
again, 5 nanometer node does not mean that the transistor size is 5 nanometer. This is just a number to characterize a node. And 5 nanometer node has been achieved only by two companies in the world, TSMC and Samsung. Actually, Samsung is more like a, uh, a forum. It's a, a collaborative effort by a number of companies, including IBM and others. So how does the 5 nanometer transistor look like? This is a prediction, future prediction made only a few years back by Applied Materials. Applied Materials is one of the major manufacturers of equipment for foundries. From 22 nanometer node to 14 nanometer node, the industry used silicon finfet that was straightforward. When the industry moved from 14 nanometer to 10 nanometer, for P channel, silicon germanium heterostructure was used, mainly for straining the channel. Okay, the 7 nanometer node used the same technique, technique and according to applied materials, this was made this prediction a few years back. So when it was time for five nanometer or three nanometer node, they suggested multiple possibilities. The first possibility at five nanometer node, according to applied mat materials was gate all around or GAA MOSFET. They could be vertical or horizontal, that's not important, but the P MOSFET was silicon germ. The second possibility that they contemplated was 3-5 FinFET. This is a major shift because 3-5 semiconductors are completely a different ball game from silicon. So moving to 3-5 materials in node 5 or 3 nanometer or 5 nanometer node meant an overwhelming change in the industry. The third suggestion that applied material made was introduction of a tunnel fit. A tunnel fit is another type of emerging transistor which can reduce the sub threshold swing and make it easier to turn the transistor off by tunneling effect. So this is prediction five, seven years back. And what is the reality now? TSMC, TSMC built five nanometer node also with the seven nanometer node technology. So TSMC's five nanometer transistor is still silicon germanium FinFET. On the other hand, Samsung's five nanometer transistor is gate all around transistor with silicon germanium PMOS. So we can see that although at seven nanometer, both the companies were following same technology, their approaches have diverged at the five nanometer node. Because as we are making the transistor smaller, the problem is becoming more open and there is no straightforward solution. I should also mention that the third major IC manufacturer, Intel, has not been very successful in scaling down the devices below 10 nanometer. So Intel is, has moved behind in this game. And recently, Intel has introduced or announced that they will make some of their chips at TSMC. So they have shifted away from their long-standing tradition that Intel makes all their ICs. This will no, long, no longer be true in a couple of years. Okay. So this figure shows the five nanometer FinFET manufactured by TSMC. These sharp spikes represent the fins of the FinFET. The right figure shows the gate all around field effect transistor built by Samsung and this structure shows the all around gates around the silicon channels. 
as I was mentioning that the Samsung transistors is actually a result of a collaboration jointly developed by Samsung, IBM, and Global Foundries. Okay, so what is the future direction of MOSFET? Where we will go from where we stand, that is from five nanometers. In short term, three or four nanometer node will come in about one or two years. Possibly by before the end of 2022, and that will be gate all around. So this is qualitatively nothing new. Just refining the existing existing technology and meeting the challenges of further scaling out. But if we look in mid terms, in about 10 years, there are new challenges emerging from the transistors. For example, artificial intelligence and machine learning is becoming pervasively popular. So we will need devices which can do neuromorphic computing. We will need devices or transistors which are suitable for machine learning. Now, for these two applications, the requirements of the devices are different from the traditional requirements in microprocessors. So what, what are the, I'll come to this block in a minute. The new requirements for devices as well as for systems for artificial intelligence and neuromorphic computing are the transistors should be extremely low powered and there should be massive parallel processing. In addition to these new challenges, there are other new applications also. Like there are a variety of transist uh, sensors which are being built based on basic MOSFET structures. And we need transistors to control flexible macroelectronics, such as flexible displays. But these requirements are entirely different from what I have mentioned here. So that is a parallel avenue of research, which I will not dwell on. Okay, so to meet these new requirements, extreme low power, massive parallel processing, we need to go beyond the present von Neumann architecture of computing. The microprocessor chip that we are building today or for either for laptops or for smartphones. These are all based on von Neumann architecture. We have to go out of that. And we also have to go out of the domain defined by Moore's law. So these will be new avenues for us in development of transistors. So what is the ultimate target? Let's consider a mosquito. The mosquito, has a few sensors. It has a tiny brain with small number of neuron cells, consumes extremely low power of the order of nano to microwatts. But the small brain with small number of neurons can do real time image processing. They have intelligence and in real time they control flight in three dimensions. If we look at a dragonfly, the flight control of dragonfly is even more amazing, although the brain is still tiny. So we are still unable to completely grasp how these biosystems work so efficiently. Our ultimate target may be this, bio-inspired systems. Although we know how to do neuromorphic computing, how to do neural networks, but we still do not know how to implement this as in nature with such low resources, with such low power, it is still unknown. So that is one of the ultimate targets for semiconductor devices. So how can we reach that? In order to reach our ultimate target, it is not enough to consider architecture or devices or materials in isolation. 
we have to look at everything in an integrated manner. What do I mean by everything? It includes architecture, it includes data representation, it includes devices, it includes materials, and it includes state variables. If we look at the present technology, our architecture is von Neumann. In some high performance applications, we also use reconfigurable architecture, but for the microprocessors, it's mostly von Neumann. Our data is digital. Our devices are scale MOSFETs. We are still using silicon and we are still using electric charge to represent binary digits. But there are many possibilities. We can go for quantum architecture. The data may be represented by entangled quantum states. The devices can be molecular, spintronics, quantum. The materials can be silicon, 3.5, or strongly correlated materials for quantum, or nanostructured materials like low dimensional, the two dimensional materials, or nano wires, nano dots, etc. And instead of charge, the state. Information may be represented in terms of spin orientation or strongly correlated electron states or molecular states. So we can see that of all the possibilities, even now, we are still using only a very small subset. The opportunities are infinite and what will stand out in the future, we cannot tell, but from our present knowledge, the quantum computing with strongly correlated materials and electron states, that may be the closest in achieving extreme low power with extreme parallel processing. So I have reached almost the end of my presentation. In conclusion, transistor have been faithful, reliable workhorses of the electronic industry for the last 70 years. Continual scaling of feature sizes have kept the devices useful. Innovations have been successful in overcoming many challenges. And as we are a jungle, when MOSFETs have nearly reached the physical scale limits. Actually, we should take this sentence with a grain of salt. People have been saying this for the last 10 years. When we reached 22 nanometers about a decade before, we were saying that we have reached the physical scaling limit. After 10 years, we are still saying the same. So what is this nearly? It is difficult to quantify. But the most important thing, especially for students who are interested in future MOSFET research, the future is still open. Research is exploring multiple possibilities to one, continue the current trend and to address the emerging challenges. Thank you. That's all for, for now. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful talk. I think everybody uh, present here, they learned a lot. And uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, making this talk uh, despite uh, the sudden family emergency. We are very sorry to hear that. And uh, if we don't have any questions, uh, is there any questions from the audience for uh, Professor Anisulak, sir? Anyone wants to ask any questions? No. So, any questions in the chat box? No. Okay. So, thank you, sir. I think you gave uh, a very good talk on uh, the current state and also the future uh, of the transistors and what the students should be focusing on in terms of their research. There's plenty of work to be done. So, if I'm excused, I would like to leave and 
uh, before the end of the session. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so, sir, do you want to take the questions now? I, we have one participant raising hand. Yes. Sure. I'll yeah. take it. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, Abdullah Sajid. So, can you unmute yourself and ask? Uh, Abdullah Sajid, are you there? In your hand. You have raised hand for a question. Can you please unmute yourself and ask? I think he has some microphone problem. Assalamu alaikum, sir. I have to let sir. Sorry, sir, I couldn't unmute. It was disabled by the host. Yeah. Okay. Sir, my question is actually for Mr. Yasin. So should I ask it now or later? Uh, I think since uh, sir is connecting from the hospital, maybe we should take any questions for first, and then we can go to our first speaker. So, any questions? No. So, okay, if not, then uh, thank you, everybody. And again, I apologize for disrupting the normal course of the event. I hope in future it will be better. Okay, thank you all. Okay, thank you so much, sir. We are really oh. honored to have you with us in our first ever webinar from IEEE Student Branch. The thank you so much. Oh, goodbye. Goodbye, sir. Thank you. Goodbye. So uh, now we have some questions for Yasin Bhai. Uh, Abdullah Sadi, please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Abdullah Sajid from first year Tripoli DU. So my question is for Mr. Yasin. Thank you for the amazing talk. So from what I gathered, uh, the frequency determines the resolution of how well we can paint with our uh, photolithograph. So is there a limit to how lower we can go for the resolution, such as say gamma range or exchange, or are there any trade-offs? So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for a question. Uh, let me share my screen again um, to, to uh, explain that. So your question is about uh, the wavelength that we use and is there any limit that uh, can we go even farther in terms of resolution? So uh, as I explained to all of you that uh, the critical dimension that we can print is depending on the wavelength. So your question is, uh, if I uh, reduce the wavelength further, can I just print a smaller feature, even smaller? That's a very good question, actually. So, uh, so what happens uh, with a smaller wavelength, uh, the, the photon energy uh, began to increase. So uh, for uh, higher wavelength, the, the photon energy is, is low. For EUV, the, the photon energy is so high, you only need handful amount of photons. Only a few photons, then you reach your dose uh, energy. So what will happen if you go to lower wavelength, uh, you come into like short noise effect. So like statistical effect. Huh? So if you have only few photons to print, uh, then uh, you, don't, you cannot gain the, the same benefit as you had before because you began to uh, enter the stochastic nature of photons. And also, first, you have, to, you have to find a source eh, which can generate a nice uh, wavelength. For example, why not use X-ray, for example, eh, so, uh, uh, as a, a source? Uh, so it's not only about creating that wavelength, but also to guiding it from the source up to the wafer. So you need to have a good quality of this uh, light source. And for UV, we could do that. And we cannot do it for X-ray. So physically, you can go a bit farther, but also uh, engineering-wise, you need to have techniques to guide this light. So, uh, so you don't you have limit also in physics, like to you enter a stochastic nature of light, and also uh, engineering limit uh, to enable to guide that light from the source up to the wafer. Does it answer a bit of your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. 
Okay. Uh, so, Professor Mohamud Junaid Burashid, sir. So, sir, if you may uh, unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Nayan. Uh, we used to say Nayan, actually. Um, we used to call him Nayan, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you for a nice presentation. I was listening to you. Thank you, Fajr Fajr. Yeah, thank you very much. And actually, um, already uh, you have seen in the chat box, um, actually, I put that question uh, just to, uh, I mean, uh, to tell the comparison of the, for the students, actually. Then Noor, he has replied with all the yeah. Um, yeah, pros and cons, that. actually. We did see that. So uh, just uh, I have just one query, actually. Uh, we know that while doing lithography, you have to use some chemicals. Okay, for developing and for uh, transferring the patterns, and then the etching strips are there. I just want to know: uh, was uh, for this for your technology, uh, was there any challenge regarding these chemicals and then the uh, etching steps uh, you are following? I could see that you can fabricate okay ten nanometer size very efficiently, but just I want to know. Yeah, thank you very much. So th thank you for Silvai. <laughs> the thing is, I'm not an expert in uh, the actual lithography process. I know a bit of the machine, but uh, for me, the the chem chemistry behind the etching techniques it's uh, still a bit mystery. <laughs> uh, so uh, so UV enables us to print smaller, eh? but the but all the all the regis technique and all the chemistry has to follow it. So I know for sure they had a lot of challenges, but they complemented each other. But uh, I cannot tell you the exact technical detail, uh, how they actually uh, make it possible. Uh, does it help a bit? Yeah, thank you. Now, uh, maybe if, uh, if uh, Noor could add something regarding this point. Yeah, maybe he, maybe Noor can can can, uh, can add something because I'm not expert on 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 etching because, or chemistry. Uh, because for lab, you know that um, I uh, we do use actually EVM lithography, and I have the experience of using uh, EVM lithography of this Caldisk uh, uh, machine. And okay, yeah, it's lengthy, uh, but you don't need any mask. That's true. But at the end, uh, these chemicals uh, they sometimes they behave um, when you send electron to those chemicals, the way they react. And when you send the photons, I mean the lights, uh, even though it's a 15 nanometer wavelength lights, how they will react. Actually, I just want to know actually, nothing else. Thank you very much. Nurbhai, you like to comment on this? Uh, I, I, oh, okay, it's unmuted. So I think, I think, I think, I think, I think, I think, <laughs> I'll, I'll type, 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 Yeah, I think Nurbha is typing it in, but I can uh, add a bit more. So, uh, so with the e beam or with UV, yeah, so the uh, the interaction with the uh, regist and all this chemistry behind. Uh, so, uh, if you have a high energy uh, photon or electron, <laughs> the in interaction can become more uh, stochastic, and uh, you can generate like uh, secondary electron effect in the in the regist. So those kind of effect you this these hurdles you have to overcome by using a diff, different uh, chemi chemistry of the of the resist. So with the higher electron energy, this these hurdles becomes more uh, difficult. But uh, I don't know exactly how they solve it. But of course they solved it. That's why we get uh, nice chips from UV. Okay. So uh, we had a question in the chat box about. Uh, the opportunities at ASML R and D uh, for graduates of Triple D department. So how should they prepare, or what are the opportunities? Yeah. So the so the thing is, huh, we are making an optical uh, tool. So uh, we need uh, people uh, from multidisciplinary uh, background. 
but the core of it is physics. Yeah? So applied physics, physics, uh, uh, fabrication knowledge. So since industry is booming, we have a lot of openings and we have less supply of people. So uh, to, to prepare for to apply, uh, of course, ASML is a high tech industry. So we, we need people uh, with uh, a bit of uh, experience with our culture and uh, the way we do things. So, so to prepare, uh, of course, the, the fundamental has to be uh, very, uh, very good. So maybe some internship in some, uh, some other companies to, to, to uh, get some experience eh, before joining. Uh, the best is if you uh, can get also a higher degree from abroad, especially Europe, because uh, then we get to know the culture is similar. So also in Europe, uh, a lot of uh, universities, they do R&D in, uh, in UV technologies. So you can maybe apply for a master's in Europe and then gradually shift to a company like ASML. Other option is if you're already working in, in a high-tech uh, company, uh, you can uh, directly apply. So we're looking for people with few years of experience who likes to work with uh, high-tech technologies and uh, with background in physics, electronics, optics. So you can just, I put on the website uh, in the chat, so you can just take a look what kind of openings we have just to get a feeling uh, what kind of responsibilities, what kind of uh, background and uh, uh, candidates profile we are asking. Huh? But the preparation should be like to get to know the basics first. Yeah? So uh, we are doing engineering and also research, of course, but uh, uh, the fundamentals has to be clarified first. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Yasin Bhai. So, Palash Bhai, you had a question. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. So, basically, uh, Noon is my friend. So, uh, I saw him. He was like a spiritual and like very hard working. So, my question is like sometimes I saw my students are sometimes audited and uh, in frustration also. So do you have any suggestion like from this stage and like how to achieve their goal in, in your field? So some kind of just little bit of some suggestion uh, we are expecting from you, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Palash. Uh, so for myself, I, 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 I as, a, as a student, when I was back in Bangladesh or even in Europe, I was not the best student, you know, I was, uh, let's say a bit of a backbencher. So I, I worked hard, but uh, not like I was uh, super talented to be in the, in, the, in the upper five or upper three, you know? So I was a bit, let's say uh, like average students, you know? But what I always tried, what I always believe in uh, that to, to whatever I know, I know it well, you know? Like uh, I, I'm, I'm not a fast learner, I'm, I'm a slow learner. But whatever I like to learn, I like to learn proper. So that was the key behind uh, whatever step I took. So uh, uh, believe in yourself. And uh, we have plenty of information in the internet and everywhere. Eh? Ask for your peer, uh, try to help others, and try to get help uh, yourself from others. So by collaborating with others, you, uh, you're going to learn a lot. And keep an open mind. Because when the opportunity will come to the door, you never know. So what I would suggest, my advice uh, to, to all, the, all the students there is like, you have to accept yourself, yourself as you are. Eh? Not everyone is super talented. Eh? So you can fill it in. You can fill in the gap with a bit of hard, hard work. But not always hard work also uh, brings uh, good results. Eh? So you, you also have to uh, accept yourself with what, whatever you are. Eh? Uh, everyone has some uh, potential with something. Eh? It's all, all about finding that moment to know yourself and to work on, on, on your potential. So my advice would be to, uh, to believe in yourself, uh, whatever you study, uh, this, uh, this electronic stuff, uh, this MOSFET, how a MOSFET works. Uh, you, you learn it in, in first year, but maybe after five years, maybe you did not learn it well. You know? So it's time to get back to the basic and see why things works the, the way it should be. Yeah? Like in, at ASML, we're not doing any rocket science, you know? Actually, the rocket science itself is not a rocket science, but uh, it's, it's about putting this fundamental together and uh, uh, collaborate with each other and bring uh, good, good results. 
So believe in yourself, uh, work uh, as much hard as you can, uh, and uh, opportunity will, will come, definitely come. That's it. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, no problem. Any questions? Anyone else? So like, like if you're also interested to apply directly to SML, if you have a bit of experience, you can also drop your CV to me. We can have a chat, uh, try to see what is your ambition and how we can uh, like how we can match your profile with uh, with possible position. Okay, so yeah, there you go. So anything else from the students? So what are the question or say? If anybody wants to have a Bangla question, put the part. Okay. So, uh, Please feel free to ask. So I don't think we have any more questions then. Acha. So we are almost past two hours. Right? So yeah. thank you again, uh, Yasin Bhai, for the nice talk. Thank you, Minor, for for organizing and putting things together. I I know all the hard work that you have to put in huh, to uh, to uh, arrange this kind of session. It's our so first thanks a lot. Uh, webinar, yeah, right? and we're very lucky to have <laughs> you and also Anisimha as the speakers. So we yeah. had a combination of academia and industry. Industry, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it was pretty nice because we have to complement each other. You know, so we cannot industry himself cannot do it alone. So uh, like in Europe, all the university, they work together also with industry. You know? So we learn from each other. And so basically uh, a theory has to be applied in practice to make a good result out of it. So it was really nice that the two topic that you uh, proposed for this webinar, I really liked it, that it complemented each other. Yeah. Thank you so much. So uh, yeah. with that, I think uh, we have come to the conclusion of our webinar. Today. So thank you everyone for joining and thanks to the IEEE student branch and IEEE EDS student branch chapter for uh, making this uh, a successful webinar. So thank you everyone.